So as a youth minister, um, I'm always receiving calls from sports organizations or teams to bring my youth group to events and stuff like that. About eight years ago, um, the Oklahoma City Thunder called me, a guy named Max, and he was like, hey, we'd love for you to bring your group. And, and I had resisted a lot of things. I mean, I get a lot of calls from people, but I was like, you know what? Yeah, let's do that. Let's do it. And so I called a few of my youth ministry friends, um, and I said, hey, y'all want to get in on this with me? So we ended up with like 100 tickets. Uh, we were going to bring about 100 people with several youth groups combined. About a week before the game, this Max guy from the Thunder called me again, and he said, hey, would you like to do the convocation? So in Oklahoma City, uh, before every game, they have a prayer, which is really cool, I think. Um, and so he, he asked me, hey, would you basically pray before the game? And I was like, yeah, of course I'd do that. So I, so I go uh, that night, and I get this, like, media pass, which is really awesome, and I walk in, and there's, like, I get to use the special entrance and I get to be on the court while the players are warming up, and like, you know, they're huge. Um, I always thought I could play, but then I'm like, no, I can't. I, I, could, I could never do that. Um, I got to meet like a referee, Joey Crawford, which I'm sure everybody, uh, Mark Cuban especially, really loves that referee. He's retired now. And, um, but then it was my turn, and then I got, I got to go out there, and I prayed, uh, you know, over all the players, and it was probably the, one of the greatest honors I've ever had. I mean, to have guys like Kevin Durant and Russell Westbrook bowing their heads as I pray over them, and they're praying the words that I get to pray. And then you have 18,000 fans praying with me. Probably a lot of them aren't Christian. You know, maybe they're different religions. Maybe they're atheists, but they are paying their respects, and I'm able to say a prayer with them. So it was just an incredible, and Max came up to me after I did it, uh, after the game, and and he was like, man, thank you so much. It was, it was great. And I was like, you know what? Thank you. The honor was completely mine. Um, maybe you've been in a place like that, a place where you were like, it, it was way out of your depth. You, it seemed like it was way over your head. Maybe you were in the company of somebody who was far more important than you. Or you were invited to a place where clearly you didn't belong, but you were there anyways. There's this guy in scripture that we're going to look at today who is in this situation. And his name is like one of the funnest things to say because it sounds like you're sneezing when you say it. And so I actually put it up here. His name is Mephibosheth. And so my inner youth minister, I just want you to turn to your neighbor and say this. Just try and say it five times fast and just see who can do it better. Just everybody right now. Uh, there's no judgment if everybody does it. Mephibosheth. Uh, God bless you. God bless you. Anybody, anybody who's able to do that well, man. <laughs> uh, I even did, you know, look, I, I put the phonetics or whatever you call it up there. Um, so this guy, I just want to give you a, a quick brief uh, recap of him if you haven't ever heard of this guy. He, he's not really in Scripture that much, but... This is Saul's grandson. Saul, if you'll remember, is the first king over Israel. However, Saul didn't obey God. Saul kind of did some stuff, and God took away his kingdom from him. Mephibosheth is Jonathan's son. Jonathan is the best friend of David, who's, who's the second king of Israel. The kingdom who was taken away from Saul and given to David. And, and they were extremely close. In fact, I'm not sure that there's another relationship outside of a marriage relationship in Scripture where two people were closer to each other than Jonathan and David. However, David has never met Mephibosheth. David, it, Mephibosheth is born in this time of war. The, the kingdom has already been taken from Saul. And so, uh, by the time Mephibosheth is, I think, five years old, all of a sudden news comes that his grandfather and his father have been killed in a battle. And they know what's going to come next because typically when, a, when an army raids a kingdom back in this, these days, they ki if they kill the king, they're going to go next and kill the family as well. They're just going to kill the entire royal family. And so Mephibosheth's nanny or nurse or whatever you want to call her picks him up and she's like, we got to get out of town. And she picks him up and on her way out, she trips and falls and his, both of his legs are broken and he's never able to walk again at five years old. It's a pretty tragic story. So not only 
is he now crippled for the rest of his life, he's like a shame to, to the world. Everybody remembers him as Saul's grandson, the, the, the king who shamed his own family, the king who shamed himself, who, the king who had the, the kingdom ripped away from him because he was disobedient from God. And so now you see Mephibosheth, he's, he's living in this place, it's kind of like on the outskirts of the country, it's in this town that's like a, a desert wasteland. This is the kind of place where the outcasts go. The people who are unskilled or lost or uneducated would just go because they're kind of kicked out from all the other areas of society. And so he's here living in this rundown neighborhood with somebody who obviously has to take care of him because they don't have like wheelchairs. They don't have modern medicine. They, you know, he can't operate on his own. He, he needs help for the rest of his life. And so, all of a sudden, he gets a knock on his door. I'm sure it wasn't metal. And they're saying, hey, we we want Mephibosheth. And he's like, you know, what? nobody wants me. Why why is somebody knocking on my door? And they say, hey, you've been summoned by the king to the palace back in Jerusalem. And I can just imagine what's going on in his mind. Like, how could this be? I'm, I'm nothing. And so, this is where we pick it up in Scripture. Uh, if you have your, your Bibles, we're in 2 Samuel chapter 9, uh, verse 6 through 7. And I'm going to turn there as well. 2 Samuel ch- chapter 9, starting in verse 6. <clears throat> I'm sorry, yeah, starting in verse 6. When Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. Okay, so obviously he, he goes into this place, he's before the king, he, he's in that place where he doesn't belong. He bows down in honor to David. David said, Mephibosheth, your servant, he replied. Don't be afraid, David said, for I will, sure, I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Mephibosheth bowed down and said, What is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? Then the king summoned Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. Uh, You and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him and bring him crops so that your master's grandson may be provided for. And Mephibosheth, grandson of your master, will always eat at my table." Then Ziba said to the king, your servant will do whatever my lord, the king, commands your servant to do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. Uh, So talk about a turnaround, right? Um, Mephibosheth's life, he, he probably couldn't have imagined it would get any better than what he had. At least he had a place to live and some food to eat, some people to take care of him. All of a sudden, that's turned completely upside down in this one act of incredible grace by David, who, ta- who, who not only says to Mephibosheth, hey, I want you to come to Jerusalem. I'm going to restore to you all the land of your father Saul. I'm going to put in place for you a bunch of people who can take care of the land for you, and you will always eat at my table. That is incredible. Now, when you think about the table, the king's table, and what that represents, it it represents quite a bit, the table. We're we're getting close to being at a table this week. But the the king's table represents, you know, this is where people come together. This is where people are united, where discussions happen. The table represents sonship. This is where family eats. The king's family would eat at his table. This is where the people that the king deems worthy sit. So the honored sit at the king's table. There's like this really special intimacy that happens at the table. Um, thankfully, they didn't have cell phones, right, <laughs> to, to kind of mess that up. Uh, Mephibosheth, get off your cell phone. Um, but another cool th- aspect of the king's table is not only are you eating there, the king is serving you, right? You are getting the king's finest, you're not there to serve the king. He's there to, to serve you a meal, to, to provide for you, to take care of your needs. Now, this would make so much more sense if, if Mephibosheth was like a great warrior or part of a great family nation, but he's not. He's a dead dog. And I love Mephibosheth's response to this invitation because it's just a shock. Verse 8, he bowed down and said, what is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? I, 
He's saying, I'm worthless. I'm nothing. I'm, I'm less than nothing. You shouldn't notice me. Uh, this, this phrase, dead dog, is used a few times throughout First and Second Samuel. And it always represents somebody who foolishly scorns or opposes the Lord's anointed. That's what Mephibosheth is. He is, he represents opposition to the Lord's anointed, opposition to King David, and an incredible act of grace, the Lord's anointed, David, says, no, 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 I want you to eat at my table, not because you're anything special, no benefit to me, but because I want to have grace because I loved your father. The kingdom is like a table. Uh, Throughout scripture, in the gospels, Jesus makes a lot of these statements the kingdom of heaven is like a whatever, like a hidden treasure in a field or like a mustard seed or like a net cast into the sea or like a merchant going out to look for pearls. Jesus uses this imagery all the time. I want to make a new story, which really is an old story because if you look throughout scripture, this is littered throughout scripture. But the kingdom of heaven is like a table. And I think Jesus, Jesus would go along with this. Um, in this story, God would be the king right? And we would be his people. We were created to come and eat at the king's table. Now, this is incredible in itself, because why would God, the king, create a table, create a bunch of people who would, basically, he would be serving? If you, would, if you were to think, if you were a king and you were creating your kingdom, you would make a bunch of people to serve you. But God does it the opposite way. He creates a bunch of people to serve them. And the question is, why would he do that? Well, that's because he's a God of relationship. If you know my God, he's a God of relationship. He's a God of love. He's a God of communion. He never created us to uh, come under him, you know, and demand us how to live and act our lives. He created us to be in a relationship with him because he's a God of love. He's a God of relationship. Uh, There's a a uh, quote from John Mark Hicks. It says, God's first eight gracious act towards us was not the cross. It was creation. We didn't deserve to be created. We have no inherent right to exist. Creation was an act of God's unmerited love. That is pretty cool. That is the God that we serve. And that's the king in this story. The king who has unmerited love and invites people to his table. So we're at God's table, but there's this other person that comes in, Satan. We can call him the peddler or whatever you want to call him. He's the peddler in my story. And he comes in and he says, hey, I have a different table. I I have food at this other table. And he's been doing this for thousands of years. You look throughout scripture, you can see it time and time again. Adam and Eve, come eat from this tree. Hey, Cain, I can't believe what your brother did to you. You should kill him. You'll be happier. Uh, David, you, you should invite Bathsheba up to your room and, and you should sleep with her because that's going to make you happy. You, see, Satan is so sneaky and he says, hey, this table over here is, is good. I, I know the table you're at, you know, that's, that's nice. Okay, God's table's nice. My table's nice too. Come, come eat at my table. And so Satan does this and he attacks our desires to have control over our lives. He, des- he attacks our desires to want to advance ourselves faster than, than where we feel we're at where God's leading us. He attacks our desires to choose the food that we want to eat. We're, we're tired of God choosing the food for us. We want to pick our own food. We want to decide what's good enough for us to eat. And so that's where he attacks. This isn't shown any clearer than in the temptation of Jesus. Uh, in Luke chapter 4, Okay, so you have three temptations of Jesus. The first one is in verse 3 through 4. Satan says, hey, Jesus, if you're really the son of God, turn this stone to bread. What is he really saying? Come eat at this table. This other stuff's going to make you happy. And what does Jesus say? Obviously, uh, he, did, he resists and he says, man doesn't live on bread alone, but from every word of the, that comes from the mouth of God. Like Jesus is so clear that I'm eating at this table, Satan. You're inviting me over here, but I'm not going over there because this table is awesome. This table is good. And I'm going to stay at this table. I don't live by bread alone. I live by God's word. And I receive that at this table. And you cannot offer that to me. 
Uh, in the second temptation, verse 5 through 7, Satan says, hey, I'll give you power over all these kingdoms that you see if you'll just bow down and worship me. What does Jesus say? No, worship the Lord your God only and serve him. And the third one, th- he takes him up to the, the tallest place in the, in the temple and he says, throw yourself down. If you're really the son of God, the angels are going to save you. Like, prove yourself. Jesus says, no, don't put God to the test. Jesus is, he sees what Satan is doing, and I wish we could see what Satan is doing as well as Jesus sees, because he's so sneaky. He, he goes in and he attacks Jesus' pride. If you're really the son of God, his identity. How many of us struggle with identity? Satan is attacking Jesus' identity as the son of God. If you're really the son of God, you know, you got to prove it. Uh, he's attacking his ability to be in control. Jesus is hungry. He doesn't eat for 40 days. Hey, Jesus, all these kingdoms can be yours. I'll give you back control. I'm sure that was tempting for Jesus. The thing is, Satan does this very thing with every single one of us. He tempts us by whispering in our ear and saying, hey, come eat at this table. I mean, how many times have we said, yeah, I wish I had that life. I wish I had that job. I wish I had that spouse. I wish I had that wealth. Why did this happen to me? Why, why can't I be happy like that person? All these things, let's call them what they are. Let's call them out. These are things that Satan is whispering in our ear to say, why don't you come eat at this other table? Because it's, it's better. I, I have food too I can offer you. Here's what we don't realize. We don't realize we are rejecting the king when we eat at that table. When we leave the king's table, when we venture off into this foreign land with the peddler to sit at his table, we're, we're actually pledging our allegiance to that king. Remember, we already said, when, when you sit at a king's table, that's an honor. That you're almost giving your allegiance to that king to provide for you. Well, when, now we're sitting down at this other table, and we're basically spitting in the face of our other king, of God the king. We're saying, God, what you did wasn't enough. What your food, it wasn't good enough. You didn't give me enough. You didn't give me what I wanted. You gave me the sweet potatoes. I wanted mashed potatoes. And we reject the king. The other thing that we don't realize is that this other table was a fraud. The food at these tables that Satan is telling us to go eat at, they don't actually have the ability to give us life. They don't have the ability to give us nourishment. They are counterfeit food. And so when we arrive, we take a bite, Satan has our allegiance, and then all of a sudden he pulls the rug out from under us. He didn't love us in the first place. He didn't actually want to provide for us. And so what happens is Satan throws us out on the streets to starve, to beg for, for scraps. Um, he, he doesn't love us. He doesn't want to provide for us. And so we sit there now on the streets with no food to eat. We're desolate. We're begging for scraps. Now we are the dead dogs in the street. We are the people who have been lied to and deceived and we bought in and we betrayed the real king. And all of a sudden the world crashes down on us. We are the spiritually crippled in desperate need of a savior crying out, why did we ever leave? Why did we betray our king? Why weren't we just satisfied with what we had? Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 21 says this, You cannot drink from the cup of the Lord and from the cup of demons. Two, you cannot eat at the Lord's table and at the table of demons. Two, the problem is it's too late. We can't go back. There's no amount of good that we can do that will permit us to leave this kingdom because we've already pledged our allegiance to to another king. All right, let's pray. No, I'm just kidding. Doesn't end there, right? It's a story. It's got to have good news. It's got to have a better ending than that, and, and it absolutely does. So uh, let, me sh- let me talk about what God does. Uh, Luke chapter 4. Again, this is right after the temptation of Jesus, which I, I love. Luke chapter 4, verse 18 through 19. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. This is Jesus talking. For he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim the captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free. And that the time of the Lord's favor has come. So this is awesome. So the king sees us desolate, starving, and he says, even though we've betrayed him, even though we spit in his face, 
He says, I want to rescue them. And so he tells his son, go rescue them. So Satan sees his son coming. And he's like, oh, we can't have this. And so we already just read about it. He tries to get the son to eat at his table. And this is going to somehow throw off God's plan. Of course, Jesus doesn't do that. The son doesn't eat at the table. Well, when that fails, Satan tries to incite God's people against him. But that doesn't work either because all of a sudden people start recognizing that this is the king's son. They start following him. So when that doesn't work, he convinces the religious leaders to to turn their backs on him. He even gets one of Jesus' own 12 inner circle to betray him. He gets him convicted on trial and sentenced to crucifixion by a cross. Satan's having a party. He's one. Nobody's stealing his people. Nobody's stealing the people he's trapped. And he's celebrating. But of course, what he doesn't realize is what just happened that three days later, the son defeats death. He rises from the grave. He conquers death, which means the way, if the wages of sin is death, he's conquered the wages that we owe Satan. He's conquered the wages of our sin, and now we're able to be set free because he's paid the penalty for our treason. So the story continues. So this means Jesus now goes, and he goes to the center of the, the town, and he starts building. Y'all, y'all knew he's a carpenter, right? He starts building a table in the middle of this foreign land, right? He starts building up a new table, and people see it, and they're like, wait, I, I've seen that before. That's, that's the king's table. But how is the king's table here? I thought that was in the other kingdom. But Jesus is like, you know what? I'm going to bring the kingdom from heaven to earth. And I'm going to build this table here. And so he goes out and he builds this table and he starts inviting people, the dead dogs of the world, to eat at his table. I want you to, uh, Psalm 23, verse 5, he says this, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. That's what God did. That's what Jesus is doing. He's building up a table in the middle of this foreign kingdom, and Satan has no power over it. He has no authority over it. He cannot touch anybody who comes to this table. And so Jesus, obviously, you've heard this part. He says, come eat this bread. Come eat, come drink this wine. This is bread better than you have tasted in years. This is bread that you will never go hungry again. This bread is my body sacrificed for you. This wine, drink this wine. It's more delicious than anything you can imagine. It's like living water. You will never thirst again. This is my blood poured out for you. You have nothing to fear sitting at my table. Satan can't touch you. Uh, we went, I went to this conference with uh, a few of my leaders um, in student ministry. And at this conference, this session, they showed this picture of Jesus knocking at a door. Uh, I think I have this here. Uh, picture. Give me that. Do I have this picture back there? We need it. Oh, there it is. Okay. So it's a picture of Jesus. Now, if you can get around the fact that he's white, okay, Jesus probably wasn't white. Uh, he's got flowing hair. Like uh, his robe somehow is able to glow. <laughs> um, and he's in some sort of tropical paradise, which I'm not sure that is Jerusalem at all. Um, but if you can get around that fact, um, the, the presenter at the conference talked about how the, he had this painting at his church when he was younger. And he would walk by it every week when he would go to church, week after week, year after year, year after year. And one day he looked at the picture and he wondered to himself, I, I, long, I wonder how long Jesus has been standing there knocking. On the door. I mean, is anybody going to answer it? Um, the fact of the matter is, Jesus has gone through all this trouble, which we didn't deserve in the first place, to rescue me, to rescue you, to set me free, to commune with you. And so the question we all have to ask is how long has Jesus been knocking on the door of my heart? How long has Jesus been knocking on my door? I want to invite you today to accept the invitation. If you haven't accepted that invitation, if you haven't accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, today's the day. There's no need to wait. There's no need to get your theology perfect. 
There's no need to get all your affairs in order. You're, we're starving on the streets. And Jesus is offering a pl- us a place at his table. He's offering us freedom that we haven't had ever. And so the invitation is yours. His hand is extended. Revelation chapter 3 Verse 20 says, Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him, and he with me. For those of you who have accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you've opened the door, my question to you is, are you following him? I think many of you in here are, but there are a lot of people who are not following him. Because Jesus' last words when he left this earth was, go into all the world, preaching, making disciples, baptizing them, and teaching them in my name. Our eyes have been open, right? We, we've seen the truth. We've seen what Satan was doing. We've seen ourselves in slavery, and we saw what Jesus did. He has come. He has set us free. But there are still other people out there who, who don't see the truth who haven't really understood that there's a table waiting for them. It might be just like right down the street. And here they are sitting in poverty, starving, and the table is right here ready for them. Jesus is sending me. Jesus is sending you to go extend the invitation to them. He's equipped you with freedom. I talked about this last time. He's freed you from yourself and he's freed you from others so that you can do this. He's freed you, he's equipped you with the good news, the love of Christ, the Holy Spirit, and he's, he's sending you out to bring back his people, to bring back the people that God desperately wants to commune with, that God desperately wants to have a relationship with. There's two things that Satan does to stop you. And um, First off, Satan is always luring us back to him. It's like, how could we forget, right? How could we forget that it was all fake anyways? But Satan lures us back to him. He lies to us, hoping that we'll forget what Jesus actually did for us. What is he luring you with? Is it being too prideful to reconcile a broken relationship in your life? Is it feeling the need to have control over certain things in your life? Is it feeling the need, the, the temptation to escape into addiction? This is, this is something that is... Uh, rampant in our culture. And I'm not just talking about alcohol, drugs, pornography, that type of stuff. I'm talking about stuff that's not even necessarily a sin on its face value. But we escape into social media or your kids or working overtime to make more money or busyness. Okay, none of those are actually sins on their face value. However, if those become our table, instead of God as our table, when we need something, if we're not going to the king's table, if we're escaping into these other things, that's when they become a sin. That's when Satan wins because he's paralyzed us and and we're relying on this counterfeit to escape. See, Satan wants to paralyze you with fear. He's already lost, but he's clinging to some people. Who cares if it's politically incorrect to share your faith? Who cares? People are starving. I don't care. Who cares? Why are we worried about offending people or being rejected? Because people are starving and we have the truth. Do we want, I I really believe sometimes we want Jesus to come down a second time and go ahead and and go out to all the people for us, right? We don't want it like, God, that's kind of your job. You know, I don't really have that talent. Uh, He's sending you. That's the bottom line. Whether you have the gift or not of evangelism, he's sending you, he's sending me. The kingdom of heaven is like a table, so what are you waiting for? Whose table are you sitting at? And if you're at the king's table, who are you inviting? My challenge to us is may we be like David, who when he saw Mephibosheth, when he saw the the man who was crippled, who couldn't help himself, even though this man had offended him, he went out and he told Mephibosheth, you will always eat at my table. Um, Let's pray together.